Okay. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the lands in which we're meeting today, and I pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging, and to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are on the call with us today. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Sharon O'Brien, who is a representative from Spleen Australia. Sharon has been a nurse educator with Spleen Australia for three years, and she has over 30 years experience at the Alfred Health, working in multiple roles. Her roles include working as a clinical nurse specialist on the trauma ward in the trauma registry research with Monash University, patient coordination and emergency management. She's also a qualified immunization nurse and has developed a strong commitment to preventative healthcare, empowering our patients to reduce their chances of sepsis. Over to you, Sharon. Okay, I just wanted, I'm just trying to get them all on the same um, screen. Slideshow from beginning. Can you see that okay? Yep. Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, as mentioned, um, I'm a nurse immunizer and educator at Splin Australia. And thanks very much for this opportunity to come and speak today. Alison, we're always trying to um, increase our awareness out there in the community um, of people without spleens. Obviously, um, probably the majority of people here have um, pancreatic, um, had probably had tumours or cysts or had pan pancreatic cancer, um, but the information that we give is the same for everybody, whether they've had a trauma, a blood disorder, um, the information for people with asplenia is um, the same. Uh, we've been um, going for over 20 years now. We had our 20th birthday last year. And it all started back in about 2002 when our director, um, Professor Dennis Spellman, looked after a patient in intensive care. It was a young woman who was 22 who was admitted with sepsis. And she had her spleen removed when she was 15 years old from a blood disorder. And um, she actually died in intensive care. And her father said to Dennis, was there anything that could have been done to prevent this? And obviously there was. So after that time, he um, got some grants, um, health department grants, and that's where Spleen Australia started and it's evolved from there. Um, my manager, um, Penny Jones, uh, she's got a background in ICU and epidemiology and she helped start the service. So um, it's got stronger and stronger and um, it continues to evolve. So um, what I'll be talking about today is just um, an overview of the um, about Spleen Australia. We'll talk a little bit about spleen function, risk of infection. I'll do a case study and some of the ways to prevent infection, which is the education, vaccines and antibiotics, and a little bit about our research. So um, Spleen Australia is the only um, type of service of this kind in the world. And um, the whole aim is to prevent severe infections and sepsis in people without, without a functioning spleen. Um, so they may have asplenia, which is, means that they've had a splenectomy and their spleen's removed, or they may have hyposplenism, which means that their spleen isn't functioning properly. So um, we're based in Melbourne at the Alfred Hospital, and we're funded by um, the state governments of um, Victoria, Tasmania, Queensland and Western Australia. Western Australia just came on board last year, which is exciting. And we are still working towards getting the other states, New South Wales, Northern Territory and South Australia on board. And um, we're writing letters to their governments every year. So um, hopefully that will, um, our aim to get all Australians on board will happen in the future. But um, yeah, at the moment, we're just, um, that's who we're covering. Um, we, our, we have a website, www.spleen.org.au, where there's lots of information and you can register. We have a team. There's four nurses and we've got an admin um, manager as well as our director and manager. So um, backgrounds in infectious diseases, ICU, um, or trauma, uh, paediatrics, and, um, yeah, so that's Dennis is a um, professor um, who works in infectious diseases. And that's a picture of the Alfred, obviously not today because it's lovely and blue and sunny and it's miserable here. This 
next slide is how to register. Um, that picture is um, our front page of our website, um, which I mentioned earlier, and who can register? Um, well, patients, we only want patients registered who don't have a functioning spleen, obviously, but people that can register them are doctors, nurses, pharmacists, patients themselves can do it, could be parents, guardians. Yeah, so um, yeah, just to go to our website, you can see that tab where the arrow is at the top where it says register. And all we want is just some contact details, um, the reason that you had your splenectomy and maybe just some information about um, who your doctor is and your next of kin. So it should only take about 10 minutes. Um, and if you do have any issues, you can always give us a call and we can do it for you over the phone. So um, if you know anyone who doesn't have a spleen, it's a good idea to let them know about us as well. It's all about word of mouth. And um, I've just put that little um, note at the top right-hand corner to say that only half our patients had their spleen removed recently. The other half had them removed like could be 40, 50 years ago. So, um, and a lot of those people, it's, it's even more important for them to register because back then they didn't get the information about their risk of infection. So, um, yeah, if you know anyone who's got a spleen, encourage them to sign up. And it's free. It's funded for by the government. So um, we estimate there's about 25,000 people in Australia that don't have a spleen. So that's approximately about 1% of the population. So um, we have currently 14,000 patients registered up with us. And we estimate that um, we cover about 60% of Australia. So I've got the states there that I mentioned previously um, that we're funded by. People do, um, it is okay to register if you're from New South Wales or Northern Territory, but we just don't give you out the same information. Um, we we can put you down on a um, as pending and if we get funding in the future, we can always sign you up, but um, you don't get the same information as what people from our funded states get. But definitely look at our website because all the information is there. That is just a snapshot of um, on our database who looks at it. And as you can see, that's over a week that we get people um, who um, click in from different parts of the world. So um, we're, we're popular in Australia, but also in other countries. Now, I'll just um, start off with this slide. What does the spleen do? Um, well, I've got a picture down here which shows where it's located, um, just behind the stomach under the ribs. And the spleen stores these special white blood cells that destroy a certain type of bacteria. And that's called encapsulated bacteria. And I'll talk about that in a minute. It also filters out old um, damaged red blood cells. And um, another function is that it also um, holds red blood cells and platelets that if you have an accident or have a hemorrhage, it can re re um, release these platelets and red blood cells that can also um, help increase your um, blood volume and save your life. Some of the reasons for a splenectomy, probably most people here today, it's for cancer, um, pancreatic cancer, spleen cancer, and um, there's also a lot of um, people who have their spleen removed just for um, cysts and tumour, tumours to the spleen, and often these are precancerous. Uh, we have patients who have blood disorders. Um, most patients are, um, have their spleen removed because of trauma, a lot of handle bike, um, handle bar to the, to the ribs and falls, car accidents. And the other type is um, hyposplenism, which I mentioned earlier, which is when the spleen stops working or you could be born without a spleen. And um, I've just got this little picture here and it just shows the close proximity to the spleen, to the pancreas, and they do share blood vessels. So as many of you will be aware that you, when you have had your pancreas removed, um, they've had to take the spleen too because it's um, safer to do that because um, these blood vessels are quite fragile between the two of them and can be easily damaged. So um, that's why many people who have splenectomies, um, pancreatectomies also have a splenectomy. But also, um, since you did say that you mentioned about um, different um, upper GI, um, people who are registered with you, 
even um, the spleen can be easily damaged in bowel surgery and other surgery. So, um, yeah, it's, it is definitely safer to get it removed if these fragile um, blood vessels are damaged rather than trying to repair it and have complications in the future. So I just thought I'd do a case study. And um, this he is a trauma patient, but he is my friend's father, so that's one of the reasons that I choose to present him. But these risk of infection are the same for everybody. Like if you if you've had um, a trauma, a blood disorder, anyone who doesn't have a spleen is at risk of these severe infections or sepsis. So um, this fellow that I'm talking about today, he um, was a 60 year old fellow that was fit and well and ran his own plumbing business. Um, and back in his past history um, was in 1980, he fell off a roof and his partner fell on top of him and he ruptured his spleen, which was life-threatening in itself, but he made a great recovery. And at the time, no one had mentioned to him about his risk of infection. They He did not have any vaccinations or antibiotics. And he just went on and was leading a normal life until 2006. Um, he was um, he started to feel unwell while he was at work. He vomited a few times while he was milking the cows and he just went home to bed. He did not know that he was at risk of um, sepsis. So uh, this was a, um, a day for him, which is celebrated by the family. Three of his sons were playing in a, the same team in a grand final and one of his son-in-laws and everyone was commenting, why isn't dad here? He must be dying not to be here. Because as you can see, he's a mad AFL supporter by looking at his prosthesis there. But um, it was the, that morning at 2 a.m. in the morning, he's woke his wife and goes, there's something wrong. You need to get me to hospital. And she caught, she took him to, straight to Camperdown Hospital. And at the time, the doctor wasn't too sure what was wrong with him. So he rang Warnable and Warnable said, give him some antibiotics and put him in an ambulance and send him to us. And that was sort of the last thing that he remembered about um, from that from that time. And um, he he was um, light, had life threatening sepsis at that time. And by the time he got to Warnable Hospital, they had to um, put him in an induced coma and ventilate him. And, and he was like that for a week. And after two weeks at Warnable, he developed renal failure and had to go to St Vincent's for dialysis. Now, he was in hospital for 17 weeks in total and got out just before Christmas. And the bacteria that he grew in his blood is called streptococcal pneumoniae, which is one of those bacteria that I mentioned earlier. So he did recover, and um, but in the process, he did have amputations to both his hands, a below knee amputation and um, through his foot. So this had um, massive effects on his quality of life. In the past, he was very independent. And from that time, his wife, he needed full assistance with everything, with that. washing, feeding, going to bed, getting dressed, going to the toilet, everything. And he, it really um, had a massive impact on that family's life. Um, so when he did get sent home, we sent him home on a daily antibiotic with an emergency supply and he was going to get vaccinated in the future. So um, with uh, with him, he's on 60, he was on 60 Minutes, so probably plenty of you have heard about him. He was lucky enough to get the first hand transplant in Australia at St Vincent's and he was all, also the oldest person in the world to get one and he did have a um, an excellent result and now he's um, he can feed himself, he can dress himself, He's back driving the car and um, going to lawn bowls. And um, it's, he still had a massive impact from his um, sepsis. But, um, yeah, he ha does have a bit more independence. So what this case um, shows is that, you know, this could have all been preventable. So if he had have had more information. So that's that's what Splint Australia is all about. So when I talk about severe infection or sepsis, we um, call it OPSI, which is an overwhelming post-splenectomy infection. It's a serious life-threatening medical emergency. And um, yeah, it's classified by someone who has to go to intensive care with um, a severe infection. 
I've got a little picture here, and this is a picture of our encapsulated bacteria, and it's a bacteria that's got a tough coat around the outside. And I've just put the name of a couple of the common ones around it, which is the streptococcal pneumoniae, which is what our um, case study fellow had, Haemophilus influenza type B, and Neisseria meningitis. Um, those three, we all have vaccines for them. And now I just put this other one down the bottom, which is the Kepto, oh, here I go, try and say it, Capnocytophagia canamorsis, which is the one that you can get from cats and dogs. So um, we, with these infections, um, you're at highest risk if you're a young child or in the first two years after your splenectomy. But the risk of infection does last for your whole life. And the streptococcal pneumonia that um, our plumber had is responsible for 50 to 90% of all severe infections. So um, while I'm mentioning that, um, I'll just mention about viruses. So when you do lose your spleen, um, your immunity to viruses isn't really affected from a spleen point of view. It may be from other um, health conditions that you may have, but um, really basically we're worried about is these encapsulated bac bacteria. So things like coughs and colds, flus, COVID, um, gastro, they're all viruses. And um, we do encourage people to get their flu shot and their COVID shots just to prevent that potential secondary infection that you can sometimes get after you have a virus. So any of those bacterial infections. So some of the symptoms of a bacterial infection, I'm sure that everybody here will know them. They've been taught after they've had their surgery, but we worry about a fever over 38, shivers, sweat, shakes and chills, and if people can't get warm, could be confusion or a severe headache, vomiting or diarrhea. It might be just one or two of them, or it could be all of them. So we always tell people that if you're feeling really unwell, not to ignore those symptoms because People without spleens can get very sick very quickly. So if you think you have an infection, what we would advise is that you go um, seek medical attention, go straight to your GP or your emergency department. But if there's any delays at all, that you have an emergency supply of antibiotics, which I'll talk about a little bit more in, the future, in, a, in a minute. But the emergency supply is a large dose of antibiotics that you can take um, straight away and it will start the treatment for um, these bacterial infections. Because, yeah, importantly, they can be treated, these bacteria can be treated with antibiotics. So, um, really, we'd like you to see your GP or emergency department. But if you can't get there within about an hour, we really want you to start taking the emergency supplies straight away. And, um, and also we provide um, our patients with these alert cards that I've got pictured here. And as I mentioned earlier, that only about 1% of the population have um, hyposplenism or asplenia. So not all the doctors are fully up to date on all the recommendations. So we just provide that card that you can show your doctor show your emergency department so that it does show that you're at risk of infection and that you need to be seen promptly. So, yeah, keep that in your purse or your wallet and flash that around at doctors and hospitals. So how do we prevent sepsis? Um, just by registering with us helps reduce your risk by 70%. We've done two studies that show that, so that's pretty impressive. Um, and as I said, we do it with education, vaccination and antibiotics. So with education, um, if you're in our funded states, you get um, a kit which provides this booklet and um, you get a fridge magnet, you get that alert card, and we also um, do a follow-up education session. Um, in our, with our education as well, we do have nurses at the Alfred that are there Monday to Friday, um, during business hours that are all experienced qualified immunisation nurses that can give um, advice to doctors, nurses and patients if you have any questions. So feel free to give us a call. Our phone number is on our website. Another way we keep our patients educated is by an annual newsletter, 
which I think we're actually sending out next week um, for those of you registered, but it just provides up to date on any changes and recommendations, vaccine advice, just as usually a patient story um, about an infection, just to um, just to help people um, with their knowledge about about that. And we do also have an app for people who are tech savvy. You don't have to have this app. All our information is provided. Um, we send out vaccine letters and um, and um, vaccine cards, so you can record that. But people who but people who are interested in the apps, they can download this on their phone. Um, and they can um, set reminders for themselves when their vaccines are due and there's a bit of information there and they can also enter the dates that they do have their vaccines. So um, that's some of the education we provide. Um, another way to prevent these infections is by vaccines and all our vaccine recommendations are from the Australian Immunisation Handbook. And vaccines work is that they contain an inactive part of the bacteria which triggers the immune system. So every, in the past, not many people knew about um, vaccines, but I think that after COVID, everyone's pretty well educated. And they know that if you have a vaccine and you encounter the bacteria, that your body can respond to that and help, help prevent infection. So um, we would encourage that. In the past, these vaccines um, were very expensive and patients had to pay for them themselves, but now they're all free for patients without a spleen on the National Immunisation Program. So you can just go to your GP and they should have them in the fridge. And if they haven't, they can get them in. But um, definitely um, don't pay for them. Don't let the doctor give you a script because they are free. And, and I think they can cost $650 for your primary course. So... Um, yeah, a lot of people that can't afford that. So that's, yeah, good to, good thing. Um, the other thing regarding vaccines is um, in our funded states, we do a vaccine plan for all our patients. Um, many of you have probably already seen these if you've um, if you're registered with us, but we um, find out what vaccines you've had in the past at your GP, maybe in hospital or your Australian immunisation records, and then we put together a plan of what you need. So um that's just a little bit of a sample there. And um, we do encourage people to ring us up every five years to get an updated plan as well. We try to get back to our patients, but we're pretty busy. So um, we're not very good at doing the five-year one. So we, if you ring us up, we will do one for you though. And the last one, um, one of the main things that we focus on is antibiotics. And Amoxil is the preferred antibiotic that most people go on. Um, and when some people need to have a daily antibiotic, usually that is recommended for three years after your surgery. But some people, and the daily antibiotic is just a very small dose of antibiotics that helps prevent infection. Um, but there are some people that need to go on it for the rest of their life. And I'm sure there's people here today who that applies to, and that's people who had cancer who are severely immunocompromised, and that's people that may have HIV, they may have had an organ transplant, have beyond di dialysis or high-dose steroids, um, the, one of those medical conditions, or they've had a previous um, admission OPSI, which is the admission to ICU with an infection. We would then recommend they go on them for life. So um, we put this down on our vaccine plan, or if you're from um, our non-funded state, this information is all on our medical recommendations, which anyone can access. The emergency supply I mentioned earlier, which you take if you have, you start to show the signs of an infection. We're not talking about if you're just feeling a bit crap with a little bit of a cough or a sore throat, it's when you're feeling really unwell. So if you're feeling really unwell, you should be taking your emergency supply. And if you do have, when we want everybody to have an emergency supply, this is the most important thing. And um, if you go on holidays, that you need to take it with you, especially the regional areas or overseas. Sometimes it's really difficult to get into a doctor, or there may not be any hospitals nearby. So if you go on, if you're going on holidays, you definitely need to take that with you. And I've also just included a bit, little bit of information about penicillin allergies. It's something that we really recommend following up because 10% of the population think they have a penicillin allergy. 
And many of those allergies were from, you know, they don't even remember, their mum told them, they don't know what happened to them. And we find that 10% of people lose their penicillin allergy every year. So um, it's important to get them tested. And when people get tested, they find that only 5% are truly allergic. So just that that's an enormous amount of people that um, that their allergy has resolved over the years. So um, penicillin is a really important antibiotic in treating infections. So if you're considered to be allergic, there may be a lot of valuable antibiotics that you don't have access to. So um, it is worthwhile following up and we do send out an information sheet. Uh, if you are allergic though, there are alternative antibiotics you can have and we have a list available. So you can always contact us or your doctor can contact us. But if we know you're allergic, we will put that, um, what antibiotic we recommend on your vaccine plan. Uh, some of the other education, I don't know whether you, um, people have heard about um, animals have got a lot of bacteria under their claws and in their mouth. And um, it's a rare but potentially harmful bacteria. So if you're bitten or scratched by a cat or a dog, um, we advise to give it a good clean with antiseptic and um, just keep an eye on it. If that wound heals okay, there's nothing to worry about. But if it did look infected, that you'd need to see your doctor straight away, any delays, start taking your emergency supply of antibiotics. So um, it is rare, this um, these infections, um, we're definitely not saying don't go near animals. We want everyone to enjoy their pets, but um, just to be aware of that. And, um, yeah, it's, what do they call it? Cat fever. I heard some, someone referred to it as cat fever recently. The other thing, uh, another thing that we tell everybody is if you're travelling overseas, um, that you really need to see an accredited travel doctor four to six weeks before you go. If you don't have an accredited travel doctor um, and you're registered with us, we do have a clinic at the Alfred Hospital and we can provide a referral there. Um, it's on a Wednesday afternoon, so if you can present in person, that's great. If you're um, outside, you know, if you can't attend in person, it can be done as a teleconference appointment. So it's a bulk build and then they can provide you what, with your, what vaccines you need, then you can have them at your local doctor. So the main thing that one of the main things we're trying to prevent is malaria. Um, people without spleens are um, at more risk of a severe illness of malaria. So if you're traveling to some of the Asian, African or South American countries, um, there is preventative medication that you can take to help prevent malaria. So it's definitely um, recommended. Uh, with blood clots, I'm just pointing that out because uh, Everybody is at risk of um, a blood clot on those long haul plane flights. But if you have had a splenectomy, you're at a slightly increased risk. So um, keep your fluids up, do your ankle exercises, get up and walk around regularly. And if you've got some compression stockings, it might be a good idea wearing them on if you're going on a long flight. So, and um, that probably also, um, if you are someone that goes on caravan holidays and long drives, it's also to keep in mind is to is to, is to um, take those precautions to prevent blood clots. And there's just a little picture of a tick. So if you get bitten by a tick and it gets infected, seek medical attention and you've got your antibiotics to take too. I've just got a couple of statistics from Spleen Australia if you might be interested in uh, that the, the reasons for people without spleens is um, you can see there that 30% are from trauma, 22% from blood disorders, probably the cancer, that most of those people would be people from your group, pancreatic cancers and spleen cancers, and um, or they've had their spleen removed from bowel surgery for cancer. Um, the 15% here, which is others, which is like people who have pancreatic tumours or cysts, which could be benign. So it's just other reasons to get your spleen removed. So um, that would be the ones that would apply to your group. And I've just got down the 6% is people who are hyposplenic, the people who are, are born without a spleen or um, have stopped functioning throughout their life. This age of registration, I um, thought you could be interested in 
Um, from zero to 100, you can see that most of our registrations are between 50 and 60. And um, the brown one is trauma. So you can see that's the main reason for the younger people. But as people get older, the blue one is cancer. And so you can see that in our older age group, a lot of the reasons that patients register with us is because of cancer. So um, thought that might be interesting to you. Now, some of the impacts that Spleen Australia has had on, um, on our community is that we are advisors for vaccines and antibiotic therapies. Um, when um, you used to have to pay for those all those spleen vaccines, um, our, our directors um, advocated for the free vaccines with national immunisation program, so that's great. And we also um, assist with um, people's air, like the Australian immunisation record. If you've had vaccines, it's mandatory now to record vaccines at GPs, but in the past it wasn't. So a lot of your vaccines that you've had in the past may not be on your air. So any that are related to um, your spleen vaccines, we will add them on in the, um, when, we, when we come across them. We promote our service at conferences. We have meetings with health departments. Um, we put meet, um, articles in journals and with immunization nurse groups. Uh, my manager, Penny, is on the radio every month with radiotherapy on Triple R. I'll give that a plug for you, Penny. And um, she was also on um, a TV show last year called the, um, the House of Wellness. So I think that might be a link on our website, but you can see that. And she um, talks about a young um, South African actress who was in the um, Triangle of Sadness, um, and she died of a cat and dog bite. So um, we just, yeah, that was, she did speak about that when it was in the, in the media at the time. So um, we do try to promote our service. We get great feedback from patients um, and doctors and nurses. They often need, the, the vaccine recommendations can be quite complicated and complex. So we're always getting phone calls from um, GP um, clinics and, um, and the doctors love our vaccine plans. So anyone can ring us for advice. And we've also um, just doing a bit of research in the past um, on partial splenectomy is that is when you haven't had your full spleen removed. Um, we've done it on some COVID, COVID vaccines. And um, we're also working with Monash University about discovering test di better diagnostic testing for people who are hypersplenic. So that's all to come in the future. And this is just a few of our articles that we've done. And um, the most interesting one out of that is um, there was in 2006 followed up with 2018, um, which is a cost effectiveness study. And um, it showed that um, Spleen Australia save um, five to six invasive infections per year in Victoria. And now we're covering more states. So that would be even more patients that are um, saved from these infections. And we're also very cost effective because they found that back in 2018, it was 80 to 280,000 for an admission to hospital with um, one of these infections. And that doesn't include any follow-up care. That's just that one um, hospitalization. So you can see from Plummer that the amount of money that would have been spent from taxpayers um, throughout his lifetime, um, that's a lot of money to be saved from our community. And um, just did some COVID studies on the negative effects of COVID and um, we're looking more into shingles and low long COVID that potentially um, our patients may be a bit more risk of having it recurring. So um, just looking into that and to see, see what's um, going on there. So my main message is, is sepsis preventable? Yes, it is. And here is a picture of our team. Um, we, we did this at our 20th year celebration last year. And as you can see, um, we've got Daryl Braithway there in the picture. He came and celebrated with us. He had a splenectomy as well. And um, he had a stomach tumour that was removed. And he actually has been admitted to hospital with infections as well. So he really promotes our um, service. And um, we're very grateful for that. And um, yeah, and we also like to thank all our funding from health departments in Victoria, Queensland, Tasmania, 
West Australia and especially to Alfred Health um, Infectious Diseases Department who provide us with a lot of um, help. So um, that's I've got a little song that I'm going to share just before I leave, but I, is, has anyone got any questions that they'd like to ask me? Oh, well, that sounds um, like I've covered it all. If you do have any questions, as I said, you can always look up our website, get our phone number, and you can always call us. And there's a, we've got a lovely group of um, nurses that are always willing to help. So, Sharon, I, did, Sharon yeah. I did have a question. It's Judy from Hobart. I'm just wondering, can you just give us a little bit of an idea of what the symptoms might look like just so that we know, aside from a temperature, what else might trigger us to think we better go go to a GP? Yeah, well, um, that's right. Like if you've got a high fever and like the first thing to do is to check your temperature. And But if you've got the shivers or sweat, shakes, like I've spoken to a few people who have felt so sick and they've just gone to bed and the next day um, they've found that they've got this sepsis. Um, so I would think that... Um, yeah, that would be a symptom. If you're feeling really unwell and you can't get warm, that would be one of the symptoms that I would be talking about. So uh, a lot of people who do have sepsis, and I've spoken to them, they do have this feeling of impending doom, like they feel really terrible and they think there's something terrible, they think they're going to die, something terrible is going to happen. So we don't want you to get to that stage. And, um, you know, I know that some a lot of people are really worried about resistance to antibiotics these days and they don't want to take them too often, uh, which is really understandable. Um, but in our patient group, um, the benefit outweighs the risk and it has been discussed. And um, if, if you're unsure if it's a virus or if it's a bacteria um, and you're really sick, I would advise that you take your emergency supply and um, keep taking it and get to your doctor as soon as you can. Is that helpful, Judy? Yeah, I was on mute. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's Pauline. Um, what is um, what is the usual, well, a regular uh, antibiotic for emergency use? I take I take um, amoxicillin. Uh, 250 per day um, yes yeah uh, but what 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 would you suggest would be a normal emergency type yeah of so what our usual emergency is two grams so take two grams straight away so that's eight times the amount that you of your daily dose and oh, then take yeah, sorry yeah and then um you take one gram which is four of them every eight hours until you can get to the doctors. Right. So are you whereabouts do you live, Pauline? Uh, in South Australia. Yeah, yeah. So I'm um, in the country, you... so I'm, I'm away from the city, um, and I don't have a spleen, um, and I don't have a pancreas. But um, only since 2021, I've had all my immunisation, but. Um, I do have an emergency side for UTIs, um, but but yeah, I just wondered what type, what brand, what type of uh, antibiotic would be the usual to have for yeah. an emergency supply. Yeah, well, we would just still say amoxicillin, and we often just say five hundred milligram tablets, so you're not having to take eight; that you can just take four, or even these days they can come in one gram, so you just need to take two tablets. Okay, so um, but. Definitely go to our website, Pauline, and under the clinicians tab, there is um, some medical recommendations for adults with our spleen, and there's like four pages. Yeah. Um, two yeah. of them have got like flow charts of what vaccines you need, yeah. and then the other two is just like a table with um, like some of the things that I've spoken about: travel, antibi emergency antibiotics, things like that. And that's what we send that out to all our patients as well. Excellent, thank you. Mike, did you want to ask your question? So just a couple of things. Maybe firstly, the impending doom feeling, like I've had that, went well with a sepsis infection, and it's the most unbelievable feeling you can possibly have. Um, 
you certainly know, like, you know, you certainly know know it when you have it. So, um, yeah. But the, my actual other question was about accredited churl doctors. Is there a register or...? I'm not too sure. I think that I'd just ask my GP, um, have you got an, an accredited travel doctor here? And if they didn't, yeah. you can um, you can just ring us up and we'll get you a referral to our travel clinic. Sure. We do still see people from other states as well, but if, you, if you're not from um, our funded states, you'd need a referral from your GP. But if you're, from, right. if you're registered with us, we can provide that referral. Right. Okay. Do you travel much, Mike? Uh, well... No, I used to, um, yeah. but, you know, I can't really at the moment because it's all a bit tricky with, you know, managing diet and medications and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. I, I, I just know. wanted to add, I'll just add one other thing. So the chance of somebody getting one of these severe infections is like 5% in your lifetime. So um, it's like one in 20 chance. So um, it's a lot more than the general population, probably about 50 times more likely to get it than the general population, but they're not, it's not really common. But obviously, Mike, you've experienced it. So, yeah, you're I one about one in 20. At least I think I sort of explained. Uh, yeah. yeah, mine I think I came from a tips and something called a pneumonia event. So, yeah. And you've probably got other, like if you've been on chemotherapy or something, that will definitely increase your risk as well. Yeah, I've managed to miss chemo because I thought it was going to kill me. So. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, you, you, your evidence to show that it can be treated with antibiotics if you get onto it early enough. Yeah, that's right. Oh, well, if anybody, um, anybody else got any questions, I'll play our song, which um, we think our song is like our major... Um, yeah, it's one of our best things to come out of Spleen Australia. People love it. And I've I've given you the condensed version. So um, has anyone got any questions before I go to our song? Okay. I'm hoping the song will work, Sharon, because we we didn't test run it, but fingers crossed. Otherwise, we can share it. Uh, later. I've saved it in a few different spots. So if I don't get it there, I might be able to get out of my slideshow and do it. So we'll see how we go. There's no sound. Cause hysteria for my function to bite. Okay, I'll I'll leave you all. Thanks again, Alison. Thanks everybody for coming, and um, yeah, let everybody know that we're out here. We might save their life.